Um, this is the setup I'm using in my practice right now. I just want to give you a few clinical pearls that, uh, that make me love the MS-39. This is what we use right now. So we have the full ocular suite and endothelial camera, then the MS-39, the Sirius, and the Paramis. And my last talk referred to the fact that the calculation of the height data is based on these two images and these two technologies. So no wonder we get very different results if anything disturbs the diffraction of light. This is a short reminder on the history of us understanding irregularities in the cornea, starting with anterior curvature only, then roughly in 2002, 2003, getting the first Scheinbrook imaging devices and then getting more and more precise now with the MS-39 having epithelial maps. But in fact, if you take keratoconus as an example, this is not a disease of the shape. It's a disease of biomechanics. We simply had no means to measure biomechanics for the last 100 years. That's why we measured shape. But before shape come changes in biomechanics. Maybe before changes in biomechanics come change in the inflammatory status. But looking at biomechanics, we now finally have a machine that can measure the total response of the cornea. And those of you who have done some retina in the past, you know very well the difference between an electroretinogram, a Gans field, and a multifocal electroretinogram, right? Either you take the whole retina or a part of it. Same in biomechanics. These devices, the Aura and the Corvus, give you the total response of the cornea. And now we have the first machines, like the BOSS or the OCT elastographer, that measure localized, focalized changes in biomechanics. And then it's getting really interesting. But let's take the MS-39. Something that I love using it for is pediatric cases. I, I don't see children in my consultation except for corneal problems. And then I, they are referred to us. Let me show you this one here. Um, the, the problem in, in children often is speed. If you have a machine that needs one or two seconds to take the, the, the image, you will lose a young child because a young child never is still. When we use this device, that's the keratographer, it's the bright light where the children close their eyes and we don't have good measurements. I like the speed and the relatively low light emission of the MS-39. Let me show you this map. Anything particular in this map or would you, in your private practice, say, okay, that looks good. The only really amazing issue in this map is that patient was not even three years old. It's a two and a half year old child. And so this I never was able to take with the Scheinflug imaging system, simply because the child does not stand still. And this is where we see more and more very young children. We screen them. This child here was, the next one was three years old and referred to us for a suspicion of keratoconus. And then it's really nice to be able to tell, to tell the referrer that it's an unusually steep cornea, but for now the symmetry is given. That's a three-year-old. And the, the next case was very interesting, has been seen by six colleagues before, including two university clinics. Our our advantage was having an MS-39 because the suspicion in this three-year-old child was leukoma, was a whitish eye when you looked at the, at the young patient. And you can see how, how shattered the data are, but at least we got some data out of it and we got an OCT image. And what we could see is a dense, it was not a leukoma, it was a dense, dense anterior scar of roughly 150 micron of unknown origin, covering almost the entire eye, highly amblyopic child. What did we do? A PTK, no scraping. That was really a scar in the, in the stroma. But with a deep PTK under general anesthesia, the child today has a visual acuity of 0.4. And under other circumstances, there is no way to, in, 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 uh, to, to diagnose and then take the appropriate treatment. I also love it in surgical planning. Let me show you the combination of MS-39 and Paramis. When we started using 
Adolf lenses, I remember we started using the Ocolentis lens. And something that, that the representatives tell you about the lenses is, is one thing. And when you want to dig deeper and understand the setup of the lens, you need to find out. And the Ocolentis lens, we asked at least 20 times, was well, we were told that this is a pure Adolf. But look what happens if you combine the data from MS-39 and Paramis, and you look at the really refractive error. Again, sorry for the colors, but this is all red. So the, the Ocolentis is, a, is an Adolf probably in the sensor, but also has a clear bifocal component. This had not been published yet. So you can, you can really know what your parent patients have if you put a pseudophagic patient in front of the Paramis and MS-39, combine the data, and then you have uh, what Knight excels as an OPD. That's just an additional very useful tool. Something else that helped me, I had a patient where I performed a femtofaco, and after four weeks the patient had a really low visual acuity, and I did not understand why. I couldn't see anything disturbing on, uh, at the slit lamp. The only thing I did, I shifted the tunnel for maybe one and a half millimeters because of neovascularizations, because of a small light panis on the limbus. So I went a little more central. And this is, this, uh, this is the OCT and slit lamp image. But when you combine the Paramis and the MS-39, you do not only get topography, but you get the whole refractive error. And you can see here this tongue of edema going right into the center. There was a slight edema that I could barely see at the slit lamp. And very comforting because three, four weeks later, this patient was, was at good vision. But this is a fantastic tool to understand changes in refraction that are very subtle with a major effect. Another lady that came to see us who had LASIK in 2014. And um, LASIK for minus three or minus four. And this was her residual refraction. She was young, under the age of 30, and the aim was emetropia on both eyes. But she ended up in residual myopia. Now, let's do a paramis. Let's look at the total aberrations. And these are the cycloplegic data. So if you look at the left eye, minus 1.25, and here, at a, I think she was at 4 millimeters. It's not that much off. So she indeed is myopic. The next thing is, if you simply would take these data, and correct for the slight difference in myopia. I would probably go for a treatment that is either total, total, total away from guided or aberration free, whatever makes most sense to me. But now, when you have an MS-39, look at the epithelial map. The epithelium is thickened in the center after a LASIK procedure. And look at the refractive power of the epithelium. If you look at the refractive power of the epithelium, here, it is like a plus lens leading to exactly the myopia the patient has. So this doesn't come from a residual error from the LASIK, it comes from uh, the reorganization of the epithelium after LASIK. So what did we do? Mechanical abrasion. And now she's almost at zero after three months. I saw her last week, I should have included this. This time we were lucky the epithelium regrew normally. We told the patient, Let's, this is just a try. If we are unlucky, the epithelium will get thicker again, but it didn't. And the residual myopia is gone. So you need to look at your, the refractive power of your epithelium maps um, when you plan for refractive surgery. Then the combination of MS-39 and Paramis is awesome to see decentrations, like here in this multifocal. And lastly, I did not revisit this one. Oh yeah, this is just a nice example of when combining um, the, the in, entire measurement. This is a patient who had almost emetropia, young patient emetropia at, um, at the uh, NIDIC autorefractometer. And just to show you how powerful this combination is, if you now look, um, this is in the 
Paramis and the MS-39 combined. And so on the left, you have anterior cornea. In the middle, you have, no, on, on the left, you have total ocular, so everything together. In the middle, you have anterior cornea, and on the right internal is posterior cornea and lens. Now look how the cylinder is compensated. If you take the ocular aberrations, there is no cylinder. If you look at anterior cornea, you have the cylinder here, 1.38, and look at uh, the cylinder in the Zernike coefficient at 9 degrees, and the internal components perfectly compensate for that in 90 degrees to the corneal data. This is why it ends up at almost zero. Just a very nice tool to understand optics in a complex manner. So we, we use the MS-39, this is taken together from both talks. Whenever there is less transparency, do not rely on Schreibflug data uh, entirely. And a low compliant pediatric patient, that's a wonderful tool to use. And uh, we couldn't be without it when we plan our refractive laser patients. Thank you.